everybody. Welcome to study number five in the book of Ephesians in our Search the Scriptures uh, three-year Bible study, almost halfway through the Bible. We are today in Ephesians chapter number four, all of chapter number four, and the first couple of verses of chapter number five. We're going to attempt to answer three different sets of questions over this passage of Scripture. We get these questions from a uh, three-year devotional edited by Alan Stibbs entitled Search the Scriptures, and these are the three questions uh, that he puts forth to us in that book. The first one is this, express in your own words the difference between the unity described in chapter 4, 3 through 7 as already existing among Christians, and that mentioned in chapter 4, 13 through 16, which Christians are to seek. How is the first to be preserved, and how is the second to to be attained. And from chapter 4, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2, lists the things which must be put away and those which ought to take their place. And notice also in each case the reason given by the Apostle why we must live thus. Question number three, in what ways does Paul's fourfold description of the life of the Gentile world apply to the life of the non-Christian today? In contrast, what three principles are to govern the behavior of Christians? Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter number 4 and the first couple of verses of chapter number 5. If you have a Bible, you might get it out and open it. If not, the words will be on the screen, and let's listen to this passage of Scripture together. Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ. God forgave you. Ephesians 5 Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. First set of questions, then, from Ephesians 4, 1 through 5, 2. Express in your own words the difference between the unity described in chapter 4, verses 3 through 7, as already existing among Christians, and that mentioned in chapter 4, 13 through 16, which Christians are to seek. How is the first to be preserved, and how is the second to be attained? Well, the opening part of this passage refers to the unity that exists within God within the Trinity or the Godhead. In verses 14 through 17, Paul is challenging the unity then that exists within the church. He's describing the role that God plays to bring about that unity and the role that the church must play in the establishment of that unity uh, among the brethren. And we maintain and we cultivate that unity by doing a couple different things. First of all, by spending time with Christ and secondly, by spending time with one another. We have to maintain our connection to Christ and maintain our connection to the community of believers. We realize uh, all that, when we finally realize all that Christ has bore for us, uh, we do that while we at the same time strive to bear with one another. Second set of questions from chapter 4, 25 through chapter 5 and verse 2 list the things which must which must be put away and those which ought to take their place. Notice also in each case the reason given by the apostle why we must live thus. Well, first of all, we must put away falsehood, unrighteousness, anger, theft, laziness, unwholesome talk, bitterness, rage, fighting, slander. And we have to take on an attitude of truthfulness, encouragement, kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. We do this because it reflects the image of Christ. Ultimately, as was said in a previous chapter, our actions will be a reflection of the grace of God in our lives, and that reflection is going to be viewed by the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Our lives are on display for the heavenly realms, so we must live accordingly. I hope you are striving to be a good example to the angels that are looking down and watching over your life today. Question number three, in what ways does Paul's fourfold description of the life of the Gentile world apply to the life of the non-Christian today? And in contrast, what three principles are to govern the behavior of Christians? Well, the non-Christian in America today is really in about the same boat as the Central Asian Church in the day of the Apostle Paul, uh, or the non-Christians, excuse me, in the days of the Apostle Paul. Uh, they are living a futile life, a life of ignorance, and one in which they have really lost all sensitivity towards the needs of one another, and they've lost all sensitivity toward God. And we are instructed to take on new attitudes, new desires, and a new way of thinking. I trust that as you are faithful to searching out the scriptures and studying God's word, that you will see that it becomes easier and easier to separate yourself from the world and that your attitude truly does change, your desires truly change, and your way of thinking changes as you study God's word. I hope you're having a great day so far. And may God richly bless the rest of your day.